printed. Such divisions may, uh, such division have been shown to reflect the cost of producing ceramics, and therefore this distribution may not say uh, much about identity rather than wealth. Wiley had higher, higher percentages in the middle two price categories and fewer in the cheapest undecorated category that appears to be the case for average wealth plantations in Georgia. While the percentages of transfer printed vessels does not compare to some very wealthy Georgia planters, it is in line with the other planters of average wealth. So I believe that the high proportion of middle priced ceramics reflects Wiley's desire to have a higher proportion of decorated vessels on his table as he could afford, because he could not afford the highest proportion of the most expensive vessels, uh, and could not compete with the transfer printed tableware settings that the very wealthy elite were using. The minimally decorated group combines several different uh, decorative styles. And if one breaks down Wiley's minimally decorated group further, one finds that 80% were shell-aged vessels. And 20% had banded decoration. This contrasts sharply with the assemblages from Wiley's enslaved people, who had 50% or higher banded decorated vessels. Thus, uh, Wiley's colored vessels would differ dramatically in style to those of his enslaved people, it would just look different from that. Turning to the color selection, 60% of Wiley's hand-painted, shell-edged, banded vessels uh, had blue on them, with orange being second most common color at 40%, brown and green on them about 20%. In comparison, at six of the eight slave cabins we excavated, brown was the most popular color, green was the second most popular, uh, and, and the most popular of the other two. So those two colors were flipped to two of them. In addition, at this time, uh, underglazed transfer, transfer print vessels were universally blue. So at 31% of Wiley's overall assemblage, compared to 20% or less of the slave cabins, uh, the transfer printed vessels and the porcelain teacup, which was also blue and white, further add to this blue and white emphasis on Wiley's table. So that taken together, Taken together, approximately 70% of the vessels on Wiley's table had some form of blue on white decoration. The fashion for blue on white decoration in Europe at this time is well known, and within his own budget and his own situation in the Bahamas, William Wiley was attempting to signal his British identity through the color of his ceramics. So in summary, to their foodways, both the African Bahamian population and William Wiley were attempting to maintain their cultural heritage on a small island a long way from their homelands. African Bahamians were constructing a collective identity out of a multi-ethnic population through the consumption of particular foods and their acquisition and use of specific kinds of European manufactured ceramics, among other items. At the same time, they were also attempting to maintain aspects of their specific African heritage that contributed to their individuality. In the planter's case, Wiley was not merely attempting to create a generalized British identity through its foodways, but specifically an elite British identity. Because in the colonial setting, to be British was to be powerful, and the maintenance of British identity was crucial to maintaining power and control within the colony. Overlap between uh, the, the motifs that existed in Wiley's house and the motifs that existed in the slave quarters? Not very much. I think there was one pattern that we had, yeah, the color pattern combination that we found the both. The, un the only real, uh, the over most overlap there is uh, undecorated vessels. Right. Uh, those are the basic creamware vessels of the time, sort of the universal. So so there was really no attempt to copy the sort of things that, that the slaves would have seen in the... Uh, no, I don't think there's any, anything we could use to support that suggestion. Mm -hmm. this, the species of fish head, are, are those species you have to go past the reef to get? Only the mackerel. Only the mackerel. Everything else was, was basically reef and reef to shore. I was just wondering because obviously you see those species, it implies you have a certain technology. Mm -hmm. um, are the fish heads in the slave quarters equally distributed, or are they showing up in? Only in 
floor of the houses we had done. I, it, it just dawned on me that one way of maybe achieving a little bit of status within the community was if I got a vote, you don't, or I didn't use the vote, I go out. Rather than thinking that these are leftovers from the boss's table. Possibly. I mean, um, there was there was a fisherman that was part of the in the, in the village. And an individual was again for that fisherman. Oh, and he would have been Wiley would have sent him oh, out I okay. uh, and, and it, I think I seem to remember um, I think that people were allowed to use the boat when it was not being used by Wiley. I seem to remember that somebody stole it. I may not have been allowed to use that for that, but uh, I seem to remember there there's, there's newspaper ads asking uh, people who saw his boat to, to return it to him. So, uh, so these fish were procured by throw nets. They're standing on the beach and throwing the nets out. I think for the most part that's the case, yeah. Okay. There's a grouper. Uh, grouper you have to use. It's it called steel bait. Yeah, he's, he's, he's not going to go for that. He's <laughs> sort of bathic. I, I mean, they're really they beyond the reach. But you're right, problem. they come along, they, they will be found anything. in the in the, in the the pools. That's right. But they're, they're the big ones. The big ones. Are beyond the reef. I don't know, I've just not been out of the and I've seen some pretty big groupers inside, inside the reef. Yes, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Clifton is one of the premier diving snorkel spots. Yeah, in that's right. In the Bahamas. Yeah. 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 Used, to be, used to be excellent. Not as good as it used to be. <laughs> well, I had, I remember doing some informant interviews in, uh, in North Carolina. And uh, they're very curious. The groupers are very curious. So yeah. when they when they swim out throwing the nets, the groupers are sort of come in, and, and, you know, and they're big. You're right. How big were they? Fifteen pounds. Some of them. They get up to a hundred. I mean, I've seen some really big ones. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're, they're very tasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, very tasty. I'm wondering if the small uh, funnel collection size has anything to do with the possibility of preservation. Preservation is an issue, and uh, the other one of the reasons I don't talk about the other plantations is the fauna collections and those is pathetic. <coughs> so small, you really can't say anything. The preservation is so bad because you have a uh, limestone bedrock there, and preservation is so good. So Clifton is exceptional in that we actually have even a semblance of the fauna collection. So that, that really distorts the distortions of what people are eating. But we did get, and we, we were able to recover quite. Small fish bones that you think, you know, you'd expect the larger bones to have more of a chance right. to survive. And it, it, it seems to be able to get small fish bones from the village area. We weren't, we weren't really getting those at the plantation house. They are spatially separated, so maybe that's what's operating. I suspect it. there's a cultural element. Um, the other thing, what, what, is the, what is the size of the ceramic um, collection that you have? Uh, it's relatively small from each cabin. 150, 200 shirts from each cabin, somewhere in that range. Uh, plantation House, actually, uh, I was fairly selective in what I used in the house in terms of. Plantation House was occupied through till 1851 when it burned down. So this, some of the upper levels of what's there are, are later, and so I kind of used the lower levels and that's what called them, so I didn't get too much. So there's about five hundred shirts. Those mocha pearlwares that you show, the banded ones and the drink patterns on it. You're it's very exciting if it's what you're saying that they were able to procure them themselves, yes. because usually they're coming in through massive and then he distributes them to his enslaved population. Right. And then there wouldn't be that choice, that option to to uh, procure a value or a chroma or a hue or whatever that, that they would remind them of their West African heritage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just, you, you have that pretty well nailed down that they were able to go to a market yes, and procure the ceramics that they would want. He allowed, they usually he, 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 allowed, he allowed, he gave them transportation. You know, yeah. that's, that's, specifically, that's pretty amazing. So it's, it's come to that, there is this religious Methodist Aspect you know, to it that he was. I should maybe tell you a little bit more about William Wise. Um, 
he was very, very prominent in, in the country and known to have links to the African Institute of London, which is the abolitionist. Now he was, but he was not an abolitionist himself, uh, even though uh, method, Methodists did become abolitionists and were already method, uh, abolitionists by this time. Well, he, William Wiley was never actually an abolitionist, but he was accused of being an abolitionist by the local planters, and his interactions with the African Institute led to him to being beaten up in the street on a couple of occasions, and uh, the planters going after him in various ways. And, and to him, I think this was part of his way of showing, trying to show them the way uh, enslavement can be carried out in a, a humane manner, I suppose. Well, his occupation would go beyond the freedom, freedom of the slaves, mm -hmm. right? Because you used to see well, the 1860s. The, well, Clifton himself, the, the main house was occupied for it. He, he left in 1831. Oh, that's all. He left in more than that. Yeah. Did you see any unrefined earthworms? Uh, I have prehistoric earthworms. Uh, There's um, two prehistoric sites actually in the plantation families, and. A couple of examples of the historic period of my journalism, but nothing that I could do very much with. You didn't see the ubiquitous colonial wares, or the so called colonial wares. No, we thought we were getting them initially when we found the prehistoric site, and then we realized we were in a prehistoric site. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I was going to comment on the identity formation, and it seems to me that <clears throat> one thing that's going on here is that uh, on, on the one hand, you've got the British. Uh, you've got Wiley trying to preserve a sense of British identity, uh, no doubt because of you know being kicked out of the United States and then having the Haitian Revolution, which I'm sure it's going on in the background there and kind of you know reinforcing that. So he's trying to preserve something that already, let's say, exists, right? Um, but that maybe another interpretation of the diversity of the ceramics found in the slave quarters is that they're creating a new identity. In other words, rather than trying to preserve the identities of all the different sort of strands, they find themselves kind of lumped together and are in the process of creating something that doesn't yet well, exist. I think that, that's what I'm actually trying to get at. So that's genesis. part of what I'm doing, is that the, this genesis of it, this African Bahamian identity by bringing these together. But then within that, you have also this individuality going on as well. And I think we're seeing both. So, you, so, you, so you're saying so we so we we have so both of these processes, right? Okay, all right. That, that's that, that, yeah, that's a point I was. Yeah, that, mm. was point. Yeah. I guess I didn't make that clear. So. Um, you, you, one image of the cosmogram. Um, oh. I found interesting because you know you you're referencing that the majority of the slaves are probably coming from Santa Gambia, but that cosmogram that you that you showed, and also the work of like Christopher, Christopher Fennell and. Leland Ferguson, they specifically draw, and even, I mean, to a lesser extent, Mark Pansky, they draw that the cosmogram is really coming out of you know, the Bukongo tradition. Right. And that, you know, the Senegambia from where the Congo is, you know, a little further from here to California. Um, and I think that sometimes we create generalities about cosmograms and these cultural continuities without really fully contextualizing them. And, well, I'm, also, from what I know of a lot of um, the presence of these X's at the basis of things, is they tend to be found on um, at water yeah, in, in the water actually, or where former riverbanks as opposed to actual terrestrial sites. So I think that yours may represent one of the few um, terrestrial excavations of a cosmogram that uh, I'm pretty familiar with. Um, I know that Fennell's come across a few. And then there's also one case, actually, here's, there's one in Philly that hasn't been really uh, done yet. But um, yeah, so that's kind of interesting. I'm always a little kind of standoffish when I'm looking at the well, cosmograms, but that's just. Well, it, I think what I'm trying to argue, though, what I was trying to argue is that I think Jack and Sue Eve are from Congo. Yeah. I think that uh, uh, they are not necessarily typical of the majority. So they operate on this. So you have these, yeah. I think, I think you've got these different ethnic backgrounds in the village going on. Unfortunately, we really don't have any evidence that ties individuals themselves to their African background because the names are all anglicized. And, you know, we just don't have anything. I think the, the real story there is sort of idiosyncratic that the persona of ownership that he's expressing is really loose. 
to, to enable many options. That in the enslaved communities in Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, and just south of here, Delaware, mm -hmm. that, that was not possible. And it was not possible in um, Jamaica, um, it was not possible actually on yeah. the uh, Out Islands of the Bahamas. I haven't touched on the other plantations that I've worked on, which are in the Out Islands, where what you talked about before with provisioning was going on, and what they got was what was supplied by the planter. And uh, I had a study many years ago when on the North Capers, and I looked at the, the color and pattern and the, the distributions in the ceramics there, and was able to show that, I believe I was able to show, that what they were got, getting were these crates of ceramics that were packaged up in, in, in England, and shipped from England, sort of prepackaged lots. It's like buying a set of China at Costco or something, you know. It's, what you get is what they're giving you, you know, numbers of plates, bowls. You buy that, that's what you get getting. It's these prepackaged crates of things, and then they were distributed to the, the, the enslaved people, but the overseer and the planter house as well were using the same ones, but they were, they, so they had, they had first pick, so they were getting the ones they wanted, and the enslaved people got the rest. But you look at the enslaved people, and they, they look very British, because they've got this British package of ceramics that they've used. So what do you know about the production and distribution of these ceramics in general, the ones that are winding up in, um, in the slave quarters, and that seem, are, I assume that these are locally made, or are they being no, no, these are all British-made. Well, British Wait, these are the ones you were just talking about, right but the ones that you're finding on site that they are choosing for themselves. Yeah. They're choosing yeah. the British yeah. ceramics. Yeah. That's machine -made, that's also machine-made British machine -made. ceramics. Right. That's that what's available to them. Are they are choosing with an African perspective. And so the British factories are producing kind of African-ish mm -hmm. motifs? No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> they're motifs, designs that were common used okay. in, in colonial America, post-colonial America. And the, it's the selection process is, is from a different cultural perspective. So they're choosing okay. out of the diversity those sorts of ones that most speak to them, if like, from the designs and the colors. They're bought piecemeal. They're bought, they're purchased piecemeal. So that's, they're, they're purchased piecemeal when they're going to the market. Okay. So but yes, they're like yeah. the that's what we underscores the variability. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you talked about how each of the slave quarters kind of had their own identity through the ceramics. Do you think that that was more stylistic desire, or do you think that was more kind of a functional purpose saying that like, you know, this style is my style, so that way when I lend you my plate, that I know that that's my plate that I can get it back. Mm -hmm. So you think it's kind of serving that functional purpose, or would you say that it was more of a stylistic, you know, we're, we're pulling in our own? I don't know that that was, I mean, I'm not sure that specifically choosing different styles was so that you could identify yours so you gave some new plate. I think it's, they did so the person, they could do that. They knew that's more like something that they bought versus they bought. This is probably my plate. This is, I don't think that that was the reason they originally did it. Yeah, that's okay. it was, I like these. These are more to my taste. Um, I've not heard of the kind of autonomy that was allowed in slaves. State. And I'm wondering what kind of records is Wiley keeping about the estate and its economy? What do we find in the plantation record book? We have a lot of letters that uh, Wiley wrote to his overseer, James Rutherford, who was a free man of color, by the way. Um, which was an interesting choice. Um, so we have a, instructions. We have Rutherford sending back to Wiley the, in response to the request, like the provision grounds. We have this list of the provision grounds and what everybody's growing in detail, what crops each household has. So, so we have those sorts of records. Um, got a lot of detail. Wiley wrote um, a treatise, basically, on plantations in the Bahamas, how he felt they should be run. And he also had a set of rules of Clifton Plantation. It's a broadside of oh, lists all of his rules. He also um, wrote to the African Institute because they were in sending out questionnaires about conditions of slavery in the Bahamas. And he was probably the only person that ever responded, but he's not for doing so. But in that, 
his, his, his answers are, you know, well, at Clifton, this is what I do. And so we get a lot of information that way. Um, because of his religious beliefs, for example, the, um, every, every Sunday, the, the population was to gather at the chapel. We've never found anything that we can identify as the chapel. It's a joke in that. But, um, gather at the chapel, and the, either a preacher from Nassau was supposed to come out and preach to them, or in the absence, which I suspect was most of the time, what he describes as the driver was to come to preach to the enslaved people. And of course, he's thinking Methodist. What's well, interesting that Wiley talks about Rutherford sometimes as um, the overseer, and he clearly was the overseer. Other times you refer to him as the driver. And he tends to do that when he's writing to others, which I think is because why because Rutherford is black. He's using the driver when he talks to others, but when between he talks about his overseer. But the point is that when Wiley talks about having the driver conduct the service for enslaved people, that means Rutherford is doing it, I, I believe. Rutherford, when you go into the records, turns out to be a Baptist minister <laughs> and a founding father of the Baptist church in the Bahamas. He's one of four men that founded the Baptist church in the Bahamas and sets up a Baptist church. When Wiley leaves, Rutherford buys from Wiley a section of land adjacent to Clifton, one of his smaller estates. He buys four of the enslaved people, puts them there, and he founds a Baptist church there and school. Wow. So Wiley is having a Baptist preaching. <laughs> well, you know, as long as you bring that up, one of the things I wanted to ask was, since you're excavating these structures, and it, at least in, in the eastern U.S. here, we're always hearing about the odd objects being excavated in the in the doorways or under the hearths or by the windows of, of, of structures occupied by folks of African origin and supposedly these are folkloric magic kinds of things. It's, did you run into any of that? Especially interesting now that you give us the background of the need for right. these folks to be preached to and the conflicts between the Christian traditions here. I expected to and I didn't. I didn't find anything that I could really attribute to African spiritual beliefs in, in that sort of way. And it's very frustrating because I really feel like to, uh, Along with, were any of the Native American artifacts from the intact sites on the shore making their way into the houses? No. Huh. I'm, I'm getting yeah. yeah, that's yeah, that's weird. I go back to the, you know, to Wiley. In his writing, intensive writing, this is really great historic archaeology, great documentary source, great field source. Does he say anything about the humanity of African Americans? Does he deny them their humanity? Does he say they are not human? No. Like the like the American ones do. No. No. He's nothing. No. He, he never he, says no. the standard phrase that the Virginians use, we hold you in the light of human beings with powers and abilities similar to our own. He never gets into that. No. No, I that's, think that's, that's why they, they they were people. See, he holds to he holds, the, yeah. He holds to that. He's looking at abolition. He's yeah. It's, he's moving at it. I'll be there. <coughs> yeah, but then he really is. But then you see, he could also be very vindictive. Uh, it's like people pissed him off. Yeah. He'd sell sell him to James Moss, Ooh. who took him down to Crooked Island and had him working in salt pans down there. James Moss was his neighbor. James Moss and William Wiley were enemies. And yet they shared a common boundary that their major estates on New Providence were next to each other. But Moss was a major uh, slave owner. He had um, large estates on other islands, not just in the Bahamas, but elsewhere in the Caribbean. And the Moss family, William Moss, his brother, was uh, basically one of the largest um, slave traders prior to abolition. So you have Wiley and Moss next door to each other there. And a lot of the conflicts in the, the documentary record are between Wiley and Moss. Mm. And so it's, it says something that when Wiley sells somebody to Moss, he knows what he's doing. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just had a comment. I, I just real, I remembered uh, that we, uh, we had a graduate student who did a, a, a master's thesis, I believe, on a farm 
in Delaware or Maryland or something, and he was trying to show, th this farmer was a Methodist, and he was trying to show by, the, see if in the material culture he could demonstrate that. And I think it was mostly in like the avoidance of alcohol, which turned out not to be true. But uh, but it's interesting in light of what you're saying about how Methodism drove uh, some of the practices there. There's really no evidence that Wiley avoided yeah. alcohol. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the one thing we didn't find in the records, can I go to your question about all that documentary record? There's no record of selling cotton, which ostensibly this was a cotton plantation. That's why I lost money. That's why I lost money. Most of what he seems to have sold was food to Nassau. So it sort of became a provisioning plantation, but at least nominally it was a cotton plantation, but I don't have any record he ever sold any cotton. I'm curious about <clears throat> the, the, the reason for the variety of uh, ceramics. I mean, if, you know, if they're presumably coming into Nassau from Britain, if the British are trying to be British and purchasing, you know, uh, sort of the blue and blue and white wear and things like that, and <clears throat> the, you know, the, the, in other sort of circumstances, the slave owners are purchasing these things, you know, by the bushel and distributing them, why, why should there be so much variation there? So that, that these individuals can actually establish their own identity. Well, I think, for, well, in, in Nassau, you have to remember that it was basically um, not, it was not just elite British planters and enslaved people. You had a whole range of, ta you have a town, essentially, with a whole range of um, free, free black people and a whole range of occupations white folks in a whole range of, of occupations and levels. So you're not just got elite British, you've got <laughs> non-elite British as well. Okay. The, the masses who are gonna be buying the cheap stuff as well. Okay. So you're gonna get the whole range being shipped there. Plus you're, you're supplying ships and other vessels that come into port, which could be going anywhere in the Caribbean or Central America too. So it's an entrepot. Okay. But doesn't that imply then that the choice that's being made of what in some ways, like a more interesting comparison, isn't so much between what's going on in these individual um, slave houses and what's going on in the planter's house, but what's going on in those houses and the various non-elite British and, and the town population. Because, for example, could it be that what's going on is, yeah, you can go into town this week and buy some, some pottery. OK, the stuff that's on sale, sale is the brown stuff that, you know, or that you might also be finding in houses that also can't afford the stuff that's being used in the planter's houses. And the idiosyncrasy could be in it because they're buying job lots. Or I would say yes, you're lots. quite right. It could be that way. And I agree that it would be wonderful to make the, that comparison. And I'll get you a budget. <laughs> Finally a place that hasn't been totally blessed. Well. I'll work on that. I look for opportunities to work in that sort of this sort of same reason. Really get some access to that. And it's it's almost impossible. I mean, but my experience, my experience has been all through the Atlantic community and with my colleagues who worked in Ireland and South Africa. The whole idea of this mocha pearlware is variety. So that the variety is going everywhere. The variety is coming here. They're going to have 50, 60 designs to choose from. Catalogs go first, use the word entrepreneur. That's probably what's going on. And so there's a great variety of choice everywhere. I don't think the variety of the options are the things that are probably determining this, since that is something ubiquitous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That may be true. More things than that. Might I suggest we continue this yeah. conversation yeah. over wine and refreshments? And I want to thank yeah. other. Yeah. Yeah.